All right, let's give it just about another minute. Let's see if any more people show up and then we'll get started. Are you live yet or? Yes, it's live. Okay. All right, so let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Polariton Chemistry Webinars. My name is Matthew Du. I'm a grad student at University of California, San Diego, in the group of Professor Joel Yuen Zhou. I will be your host for today's webinar, featuring Dr. Saeed Rodriguez from AMO. Before we get started, let me make a few announcements. The Journal of Chemical Physics has a special issue titled Polariton Chemistry, Molecules and Cavities in Plasmonic Media. Both theoretical and experimental contributions are welcome, and the works may fall under any of the many topics within Polariton Chemistry. Uh, to learn more, go to jcp.aip.org and go to the upcoming special topic session. Submission is now open, and the deadline is October 16. Here's the schedule of talks for the next month. Remember, there's a talk every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and for each talk, you must register at this link. We have a very exciting lineup, uh, but I just want to feature um, two of the talks, the ones on August 19th. Those talks comprise our second ever postdoc spotlight. This is a special event featuring two 25-minute talks from two excellent postdocs. This time, we have Dr. Q Hyung Park from Princeton University and Dr. Claudia Clement from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Next, if you haven't signed up already, please join the Polariton Chemistry Online Community. This is a public Facebook group and it's a, a central location where future webinars, papers, conferences, job postings, and more related to Polariton Chemistry will be posted. There's also a YouTube channel associated with this webinar series. You, you can go here to watch and rewatch previous webinars. If you haven't done so, please subscribe. Now let's go over the mechanics of this webinar. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see three buttons, chat, raise hand, Q&A. If you'd like to have a discussion with your fellow audience members or also the host and the panelists, the host and the speaker, type it in in chat. If you wanna ask a question during the talk or after the talk, click raise hand. At an appropriate time, I'll ask the speaker to pause. I'll unmute you and you may ask. Finally, you can also type in your questions via the Q&A option. At the very end of the talk, any question in the Q&A box will be answered. Now, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Saeed Rodriguez. From AMOF. So, Dr. Said Rodriguez got his PhD with cum laude honors at TU Einhoven, having worked at AMOF and Phillips under the supervision of Professor Jaime Gomez Rivas. Said's thesis on light matter coupling and metallic nanoparticle arrays received the 2015 FOM Thesis Prize award to the best physics thesis in the Netherlands. After his PhD, he worked as a Marie Curie Fellow at the Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnologies in France under the supervision of Professor. Jacqueline Bloch and Dr. Alberto Amo. There, he studied nonlinear and quantum dynamics of polaritons in three five semiconductor cavities. In 2017, Dr. Rodriguez returned to AMOF where he started the Interacting Photon Group. In 2019, he received an ERC starting grant to investigate nonlinear and optoelectronic properties of polaritons. In 2020, he received the Early Career Award from the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science. He's published 32 peer review articles, co-authored four patents, given more than 30 invited talks at various conferences. His group currently studies stochastic and nonlinear dynamics of light and polaritons in perovskite semiconductors. They're interested in phenomena emerging from the interplay of nonlinearity and noise in driven dissipative systems, as well as applications such as sensing and computation. Without further ado, Dr. Rodriguez, the screen is yours. You may share. All right. Uh, thank you very much for this nice introduction, Matt. And um, 
Thank you to the organizers and uh, groups of Huel and Wei. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to um, yeah, contribute to this webinar series. Uh, that's been uh, really wonderful and uh, I've enjoyed uh, very much so far. So it feels great to, to contribute uh, with uh, our research. Um, so um, I'll be talking about non-Markovian uh, stochastic resonance of light and um, if these words seem a little foreign, uh, I will uh, um, introduce them uh, gently through, throughout the talk, and I hope that uh, by the by the end of the talk, it's clear uh, what this uh, what this all means. So I would like to start with a motivation for um, for our research. So so some of the physics that I find very uh, interesting and fascinating. Um, and I present you here three examples of physical systems on very different uh, length. Uh, and also time scales, uh, where noise plays a prominent role. It's not some you know, nuisance or some secondary effect, but actually sort of the main physical uh, phenomena are emerged due to the noise. And I think one of the most uh, well-known examples in, in this um, class of phenomena is, uh, the, has to do with the recurrence of ice ages in, uh, in our planet. And so in the 1980s, uh, Bensi and co-workers proposed that um, a plausible explanation for the uh, um, switching uh, of the average temperature in our planet between two metastable states. And this plausible explanation involved the, the combination of uh, noise and periodic driving. And the periodic driving has to do with the eccentricity of the orbit of uh, our planet uh, around the sun. And the combination of these two effects gives you a switching that is on the tens of thousands of years uh, to 100,000 years, maybe. This is a plot here. Um, do, you, do you see my cursor? Uh, no? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, yeah, okay, great, thanks. So this is a plot here of uh, the temperature around Greenland um, and relative to some uh, steady state mean value, which is the zero here. And you see that there are these sort of fast excursions and switching events between sort of this plateau here and uh, another one here. So in the last 10,000 years or so, we are living really truly a rare event. So we should feel very fortunate that the, the planet is so warm and makes uh, life uh, enjoyable for us. And so um, these switching events have to do with tiny fluctuations in the incoming uh, solar radiation, right? And so. This, uh, this was the, the, the first um, uh, case in which uh, noise was proposed as a, as a mechanism that gives rise to, to sort of very uh, predictable and uh, interesting effects. I'll go down many orders of magnitude uh, in, uh, in length scales, and you find this, this uh, beautiful creature that is a, a paddlefish. So there's uh, six varieties of them. Five of them are already extinct. The last one was extinct last year due to change in, uh, in the climate. Uh, but this one remains. And this, this paddlefish has the, the, the property that um, in this nose that looks like a paddle, he has a lot of electrical uh, receptors that detect signals from plankton. And so he feeds on plankton. And this guy lives in muddy waters, so he cannot see very well. Um, and what the research, these researchers uh, studied in the, in, in, in the 90s is um, how does the ability of this paddlefish to detect plankton depend on the strength of the noise in the environment? So this is the electrical noise. And they found that there is an optimal amount of noise for which the paddlefish is able to maximize the, the length, the range of the distances over which it can successfully detect plankton. And so basically he turned noise into an advantage, probably because he cannot see very well in these muddy waters. And so that's another example of um, a stochastic resonance. I'll go down again many orders of uh, magnitude in uh, length and, uh, and uh, time scales. And you find these very interesting uh, light harvesting complexes in uh, various uh, photosynthetic organisms like uh, bacteria and plants. And you know, about 20 years ago, people started to, maybe a bit less, people started to get very uh, intrigued by how it was possible that these complexes can transport excitations at, with a Carnot efficiency, which is basically as high as allowed by the temperature difference between the Earth and the, um, and the Sun. And there were all kinds of explanations re related to entanglement and quantum effects. Um, 
And this is a little bit of a controversial uh, field uh, that I don't want to get too much into, but there was this nice series of works by the group of uh, Martin Plenio. Uh, so it's this paper by uh, Caruso et al, where they show that basically noise is the key resource. So um, these are disorder complexes where transport is typically arrested by disorder in the energy landscape. But when you add dynamic disorder, uh, so basically noise, then that helps the excitations to escape from local minima. And that can actually enhance the, the transport efficiency. And this is one plausible explanation for how come these systems are so efficient in transporting energy, even though they're hot, they're wet, and they're disordered, right? Which is sort of everything different from what we think uh, a, a good uh, network should have. All right. So I'm going to try to to give you a simple picture by which we can understand this this apparently counterintuitive physics of a stochastic resonance. So I'm going to uh, um, appeal to a very famous problem in uh, statistical mechanics, which is that of a, a, a Brownian particle in a double well potential. And it's actually a very uh, important model in the context of chemistry as well. It's widely used to understand uh, chemical reactions. So consider a, a particle that um, can fluctuate because it's in some uh, heat bath, it's in some thermal bath. And uh, it's confined in a, a potential that has two minima at minus and plus uh, XM. And uh, because of the, of the thermal fluctuations, you will find that there is a characteristic time on which the particle can cross the barrier. And the inverse of that time is known as the Kremers rate. Uh, and uh, so this was um, uh, explained by Kremers already in the 40s. And that time depends basically exponentially on the, um, on the height of the barrier and the, the noise strength, so KT in this case. So take such a system, and now imagine that we modulate it periodically so that we tilt the barrier, uh, so that we tilt the potential one way and then another, right? So we do this periodically as shown here. So when the potential is symmetric, the, the, the particle has equal probability to be in either of the wells, but when you tilt it to the right, then he will spend most of the time in this well and less in this one. And when you tilt it to the left, it's, it's the opposite, right? And so now you can imagine that the, the period of this modulation can synchronize with the crossings of the barrier just due to the, the, the Kramer's rate, right? And so when this happens, which is the time scale matching condition, when the modulation period is twice over the Kramer's rate, you have a stochastic resonance, right? So that the random crossings synchronize with the deterministic force. And that's the essence of uh, a stochastic resonance. So, now I'm going to switch to optics and I will basically explain you how, how we can probe the, the physics of the system using uh, the, the physics of stochastic resonance using a very uh, minimalistic uh, optical system, which is a, a single mode nonlinear camera. So this is what I illustrate here in the, in the, in the image in the background. Um, basically, I have two mirrors, one of them con concave so that I confine the optical mode in all three dimensions, in the optical axis by the mirrors and laterally by the curvature of the mirror. And the equation of motion for the light field alpha inside our cavity is this one, where um, you basically have uh, these three terms here. Uh, one of them is the detuning between the laser frequency omega and the resonance frequency omega zero. So that's the, the relevant energy scale in a frame that is rotating at the driving frequency, omega. Then you have this nonlinearity term, this u alpha squared times the extra alpha here. So it's a cubic nonlinearity, which is um, known as a Kerr nonlinearity. And physically, you know, at the level of Maxwell equation, this corresponds to a nonlinear refractive index, N2, what is shown here. So you, I have some material in the cavity that has a nonlinear refractive index that depends on the intensity. On the of the incident line, which is F squared. And then I have a total decay rate, capital gamma, which is the sum of the leakage through the two mirrors plus some other leakage uh, or loss rate, little gamma, which I attribute to absorption. And so the sum of those is the total loss rate. And then I say that this cavity is driven by a coherence field uh, of amplitude F through the first port, and that's why you have this one here. The output of these cavities, the transmission, basically is proportional to the intensity of the uh, light in the cavity, which is alpha squared. In this case, times the, the, the output rate is the transmission. So let's look at the steady state solutions of the system, uh, which you obtain by basically setting 
alpha dot equal to zero. Right? So you just solve set this equation equal to zero. And I'm going to show you the, the, the density, the number of photons in the cavity, alpha squared, um, times a dimensionless constant, u over gamma. u is the nonlinearity strain, which you know for an op optical system is the photon photon interaction strain. And gamma is the loss strain. And I'm going to plot that as a function of the tuning delta divided by the line with capital gamma. The blue curve is when the amplitude of the driving is small, which gives you a small density in the cavity. And so u alpha squared is much less than gamma. That's why I have to multiply here by 100. And what you see is just a Lorentzian resonance. Right? So you have a harmonic oscillator. That's it. Now, if you increase f, basically this term grows. And then the interaction energy, which is this whole thing, can become commensurate or exceed gamma. And then you get a shift in the, in the line shape. And it's a blue shape because I assume positive u. And then you get a region of bistability, which basically you have two steady states at a single driving condition. And those are the black ones here, that they are stable. And you also have an unstable state that is uh, shown here in the, in the middle. So now you can see this bistable system is basically the optical analog of our double well potential, where the, the two steady states basically correspond to um, this uh, minima of the, of the potential. So now um, you can ask, okay, but where did you get this nonlinearity from, right? So, and um, there are, um, I think, uh, two basic approaches that are widely uh, explored and used in the, in the field. Um, the first one, I think, is probably the more familiar to the polarity community is that um, you hybridize photons with excitons. And so remember that this kind of kernel linearity corresponds to an effective interaction between photons. And so photons in free space don't interact, but if you couple them to a material excitation that does interact, then effectively the photons interact. And so that's the, that's the essence of this, you know, strong kernel linearity from polaritons, that polaritons interact via their exciton part. And what um, a number of works have shown is that this interaction energy, u, scales with the square of the exciton fraction. Um, and that's also proportional, u is also proportional to n2, the nonlinear refractive index. Um, now, this is a nice approach because uh, the interaction between uh, excitons is very fast, sort of femtoseconds sort of time scale. And so if you want to make an optical switch, that's, that's, that's pretty good, right? Um, you want to have a fast uh, nonlinearity. Now, the problem is that um, as far as I know, there is not a single uh, polariton system that you can get a sufficiently strong nonlinearity to observe by stability under continuous driving at room temperature, right? So there's many words that show a strong interaction with polaritons, but they're, op they're opposed. And the reason is that if you pump them continuously, typically the material bleaches. And so the, by, by the time that you start to see a nonlinearity, the, the material broke down, right? Um, so that's, I think, one of the big challenges that I reckon in the field, uh, um, to find a, a, a material that has a strong kernel linearity at room temperature and that sustains a continuous drive, right? So the second approach to get this uh, strong kernel linearity, and this is, uh, the one I will be focusing the, the rest of my talk is uh, via thermal effects. And so instead of putting a quantum well inside the cavity, um, in my group, what we do is we put a drop of uh, oil. Um, I'll show experiments actually, these are sort of uh, things that you probably associate with your salad or your meal. So we put olive oil and we put macadamia oil. And these things behave uh, amazingly uh, well. And I'll show you just how well these things uh, behave. And so you can understand this uh, thermal nonlinearity in a similar way as the polariton one, where you have a nonlinear uh, refractive index, uh, so N2. Um, and um, the difference is that N2, instead of related to electronic interactions, is related to thermal effects. So basically, it's a change in the refractive index of the, of the material in the cavity as a function of temperature. And the change in temperature is itself induced from the absorption of light. Okay? Now, the fundamental difference is that the refractive index doesn't raise or decrease to a certain value instantaneously, but it takes a certain time. And this time is just basically the, the, the thermal relaxation time, the time that it takes to, to something to heat or cool down. And so for the systems we'll be looking at is on the, on the microsecond timescale. 
Now, if you want to do you know, an ultra fast optical switch, this is definitely not the way. Um, I think one advantage is that you can do this uh, relatively straightforward at room temperature and under continuous driving. Um, and I will show you that this thing that actually looks like uh, 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 an issue is actually the very resource that um, is going to give rise to a lot of the very interesting physics that um, I would like to, to, to discuss with you uh, later uh, in the talk. Okay, so let me show you some measurements now. Uh, we, basically, we're going to look at this system. So we have a fabric perot cavity where one of the mirrors is concave, so we have transverse confinement of the optical mode besides the, the longitudinal confinement. And that way we realize a single mode cavity. Uh, our mirrors are mounted on piezoelectric actuators. So basically we can do this kind of motion and just you know, open and close the cavity um, at different speeds. And uh, we also control the optical power and that's how we access the, the nonlinear regime. So I show you here measurements of the transmission of a continuous wave laser. So I just have a, a green laser hitting my cavity, continuous wave. Um, and I just do like this to the cavity. I close it and I open it. And I measure the transmission. When the power is low, you see the, the green and the black curves are the transmission basically when opening and, and then closing respectively. And these two are the same. And the gray line here is just a Lorentzian light shape. So you just have a linear oscillator, right? When you increase a little bit more the power, then you get these two states, like the bistability, and you have this kind of hysteresis. And if you increase even further, further the power, you get a, a larger hysteresis, um, and then you get this extra feature that I'll be discussing uh, in more detail in a moment, which is an overshoot that is related uh, to the thermal uh, nonlinearity. Um, the gray curve here is the steady state solution that you find captures most of the behavior, but it deviates uh, in some regions. Now I'll explain uh, where the deviation comes from. Okay, so let me show you some uh, more experimental results uh, of this uh, system where now we're, I'm gonna fix the power in the bistable regime, so around here. Uh, and I'm just gonna vary the speed at which I open and close the cavity. Um, and I'm gonna call that frequency of opening and closing F0. Um, in practical terms, this is some, somewhere around 10 superhertz. Um, the exact frequency is not so matter because also the amplitude matters. So it's the speed with which you, know, you cross the resonance that uh, gives rise to, to the dynamics. So this is measurements of the average hysteresis for uh, uh, F0, uh, where I have now converted the range of mirror position. This was in nanometers, right? So this was the displacement of our mirror. I have now converted to a detuning delta which is the frequency difference between the cavity resonance and the, and the laser frequency divided by the language. And so this language we, we get from the, from the linear spectrum, basically from, from this one, right? And so this is the, the, the hysteresis at F0. You increase the speed by a factor of seven, and then you see that this overshoot that we were seeing before now becomes quite broader, and the other curve also changes, right? So you start to see some kind of behavior that you don't see in the normal uh, by stability of a kernel linear cavity. And if you increase another factor of seven, then basically, you know, the overshoot becomes like really broad and starts to uh, resemble the, the, the other uh, curve. And this starts to look kind of like Lorentzian. So basically what's happening is that, you know, I'm going at a speed that is approaching the, the, the response time of the system, the, the thermal relaxation time. And so the nonlinearity is effectively decreasing. So this kind of effects, uh, basically this, change, dramatic change in the, in the line shape uh, in the nonlinear regime at high speeds. And the overshoot, even at low speeds, are not described by the standard uh, model with the kernel linearity, like I showed you in the, in the introduction. So we need to modify the model. Um, and this is where the, 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 the story of the non-Markovian dynamics come from. So, so I want to sort of just tell you what, um, uh, where this, uh, so the previous slides were just to motivate the modification of the model. And now I want to explain you how we actually motivate, uh, modify it. So this is the nonlinearity that we start with, is the instantaneous uh, kernel linearity. And what we're gonna say uh, in a phenomenological way for the moment is that the response is not instantaneous as assumed here, but rather is uh, uh, of this form, meaning time dependent, uh, so we now have an integral differential equation. 
where now the nonlinearity uh, that was just you know a constant before here now contains this k, which is a memory kernel. And this we assume to be exponential. It's the simplest form of the kernel that you can assume. Um, and what this means is that um, when the laser hits the cavity, there is a characteristic time tau on which the temperature increases or decreases, right? If you turn off the laser suddenly, the laser, um, the, the, the oil in the cavity will be at a certain temperature and suddenly it will go down. And this going down will be exponential in time. And the time at which it reaches one over E is roughly tau. So that's the meaning of this uh, kernel. Now, the implication of making this modification to the equation of motion is that the response of the system no longer depends on the immediate past only, but actually depends on the entire past, right? Because you have an integral from zero to t, right? So the hallmark of Markovian systems is that if you know, and all Markovian physics is that if you know the state of the system at a given time, and you know the equations of motion, you can predict it at the moment after and any time after. Now, this is a system in which, if you know the state of the system at a certain time, you, it's not enough to predict the, the, the immediate uh, future. You need to know the, the history, and the history is weighted by this uh, memory kernel. Okay? Um, here we still have a deterministic system. I'm going to bring in the noise uh, later, but this is basically where the memory comes from. Okay. Now, with this modification, we perform uh, simulations uh, of this uh, using this model that I just showed you, and we reproduce all the, the behavior observed in experiments at, uh, at the various speeds. We see how the hysteresis area changes, and then these are just three examples of different speeds. Um, in this paper, uh, we published uh, uh, a few months ago, we show actually that the hysteresis area, which is basically the difference between the blue and the black curve, actually follows a, a universal uh, scaling law uh, as a function of the, of the scanning speed, or if you like, the modulation period relative to tau. Uh, and this uh, scaling law is uh, universal in the sense that it doesn't depend on the system parameters like the laser amplitude, the frequency, the detuning, the loss rate, the nonlinearity. All of that is irrelevant. There is a single power law that has an exponent minus one that describes the, the decay of the hysteresis area at high speeds. So that's what we showed in this paper. Um, but the important thing to remember for what's coming next on stochastic resonance is that the hysteresis area is entirely determined by the ratio of the modulation period to the thermal relaxation time, right? So this is when this one is too large, very large, you see something like this. And when this one is very small, meaning a fast scan, you start to go to some graph. Okay, so now we're gonna add noise to the system. This is the equation of motion that I showed you uh, a moment ago. Um, and I'm gonna uh, include additive noise. So basically this is noise that is added to the driving field, which um, basically corresponds to amplitude and phase noise in the laser. Now, um, for those of you more, more um, you know, trying to uh, understand the origin of this equation from the polariton perspective, um, if you set tau equals to zero, it's kernel linearity, right? And when d is the square root of gamma over two, which is basically, you know, comes from fluctuation dissipation, right? Because you have dissipation, you know, you need to have fluctuation. And the variance of that fluctuation is gamma over two. So the standard deviation is the square root of gamma over two. And when you have that variance, then the strength of these random fluctuations, which are these two terms, these are random Gaussian processes, the strength of these terms exactly reproduces the strength of quantum fluctuations. And this is what is known in the polariton uh, uh, literature as the truncated Wigner uh, approximation, right? So the, the predictions of this system with tau equals zero and d equals square root of gamma over two, match to a very good extent, you know, excellently, I would say, the predictions of a quantum master equation, as long as u over gamma is not too large, right? And so basically when it's too large, and you know, when basically the nonlinearity is so strong that you need just a few photons uh, to get by stability. 
So that's that's the the, the connection to to polarities, right? But here we are not constrained to the v of a particular value because, um, as I will show you in a moment, we can control d in our uh, experiment, and we can see the the effect of uh, having nodes. Um, for this particular talk, uh, I will focus on um, zeta one and zeta two being um, uh, Gaussian processes that uh, give us white noise. So the noise power is constant in frequency. And that means that uh, the noise is delta correlate. Yeah? This arbitrarily is more uh, correlation than the noise. So let's look at this uh, calculation that I showed you of the visibility a moment ago uh, of the number of photons versus the tuning. And now we're going to park the driving parameters somewhere here so that you have uh, um, a detuning and an amplitude that is just right to get you by stability. And if you had no noise, you would stay in either the upper state or the down state forever. But because you have noise, now the system can spontaneously switch between the two states just in the same way as the Brownian particle could cross the barrier uh, and go from one of the minima of the lower well potential to the other. Notice the time scale here. Uh, this is 10 to the 5 uh, gamma minus 1. So basically, the switching time is much, much longer than um, the, the, the decay time, which is the, 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 um, related to the reaction time of the system in the linear energy. But now, the switching time can be actually arbitrarily long. It just depends on the strength of the noise relative to the number of photons in the bistability, which is related to the nonlinearity. All right. So, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, we have a question. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful, yeah. So, all right. So, well, uh, you can go. Sorry, Said. Uh, I got a little bit confused. So, uh, normally there is a relationship between D and and uh, gamma by fluctuation dissipation. But again, now you are going to make D. You are going to control D arbitrarily. And why are you allowed to do that? And right. And break right. fluctuation dissipation. Can you explain that again? Yes. So as you say, there is a, a constraint on D uh, by fluctuation dissipation because we have gamma, but that really refers to the internal noise of the system, right? Which is mm -hmm. basically the noise that you have in, in equilibrium. Now, what we're gonna do is, if, if you notice, this, is just, this term is just added to F. You know, mm -hmm. we can just make our laser very noisy, right? And I'll show you in a moment how we do that. Basically, we just pass it through a modulator where we just, you know, imprint a lot of noise in the laser. And we can make it anything we want. But then why is there no extra dissipation then? On right. the system? Because um, you could think that we are adding another term here, if you like, where basically the first one is the internal, uh, which is related to the dissipation. Mm -hmm. And then we are adding another one on, term, on, on top, which is also white. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that one is unconstrained, because that one basically we do outside the cavity. Mm -hmm. I see. I think I understand this. Okay. I Thank think you. it will become clear like two two yeah. slides down the down the down the way. Okay. Uh, and also, um, I'm not sure if okay. So in chemistry, there is this connection between um, the the non-Markovian version of the Kramer's theory is called the grote heinz theory. But then uh, people normally don't talk about uh, the external modulation with the deterministic uh, changes in the double well. Um, so. Is this related to this grote Heinz uh, theory by any chance? Like, because there are also interesting things that happen in that yeah. equation without, yeah. yeah. To be honest, uh, I don't know the grote Heinz theory. So in, in physics, and I think in statistical mechanics, the, the, the most famous type of non-Markovian equation is what people call the generalized Langevin equation. Sure. Uh, which was introduced by Mori, actually. It's also known as the Mori uh, equation. Sure. Uh, but there is a very important, so thank you for bringing that, that out, because there is a very important difference in the class of non Markovian dynamics that I'm going to show with respect to those uh, systems. And it is that in those systems, the, the non Markovianity, the memory, comes from realizing that the dissipation is not instantaneous, right? Because yes. the, the dissipation There's is a the viscosity, of, yes. Exactly, exactly. The dissipation is the coupling of the system to the back. And then mm -hmm. what this equation, you know, assumes is that that coupling is instantaneous. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say, okay, I don't let it be instantaneous, 
do you find that there is a, a, a characteristic time? And then by fluctuation dissipation theorem, then the noise also gets modified and the noise becomes colored. It acquires a finite uh, correlation time, mm -hmm. right? So that's generalized Langevin equation where the noise the correlation time is constrained by the memory time of the dissipation. Mm -hmm. Now here, what we have is a system that has memory, but the noise can be white. And that's a, a different kind of- Yeah, that's different. Yeah? I see. And I will explain the, the consequence of the system and why it really leads to um, these different really results in uh, new physics uh, that you don't get uh, if you assume the other type of uh, non markovian Okay, but the, sorry, one last question. But then the, this, this mismatch between the fluctuation and the dissipation, doesn't it lead to situations where the steady state, I guess, doesn't satisfy an effective temperature? I, I will, I guess, yeah, like the thermal yeah. equilibrium at steady state is not satisfied. Yeah, so here I'm not uh, invoking any temperature at all, right? There is no... Um, there is no temperature at all here. Um, mm -hmm. I made a kind of analogy to a, a, a Brownian particle uh, at finite temperature, um, but that analogy has some caveats that um, is, is not a very rigorous uh, analogy. And uh, actually we're working on, on, on this um, now, but we haven't really figured it out. So I would prefer to, to not go mm -hmm. too much into that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there, let's, let's just say that it's, it's not a very rigorous analysis, right? Because I think that there is no temperature whatsoever here, right? You have non-equilibrium mm -hmm. steady states and there is nothing that drives the system to some thermal distribution at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there more questions? No? All right. No, that's good. So then I uh, continue. All right. So... Um, so, okay, we're going to look at, um, I think I, I already uh, showed you that basically um, why our system has memory and it basically has to do with this finite uh, uh, relaxation time of, of the temperature. Um, you could also ask a different question. You could ask, um, well, um, suppose that you have an optical system and that you, you know, measure it, the transmission of light through it or you have any other system, right? And you measure a time series like the one I'm going to show you here, right? I'm showing you here. Suppose you measure a time series. How can you tell if this system has memory or not? How can you tell if the system is Markovian or not, right? On the basis of the time series only, where you have this switching event. So when you have this kind of bistable system, there is a very uh, clear indicator, which is the, the residence time distribution. So we're going to look at, basically you have switching between metastable states, right? So this is one of them, and then here is the other one. Um, and we're going to look at uh, the time that the system resides in the lower state or the upper state, right? So basically, this is one event, and it has this duration. This is another event, and it has this duration. This is another event, it has this duration, and so on. And I'm going to build a, a histogram, or a PDF, if you like, of those events. And that's what I call a residence time distribution. Um, and so I first show you a calculation where this uh, distribution of residence times, basically I look at the, at the log 10 of the events. Uh, so this is here, just basically you can think of it as a histogram. And on the horizontal axis is, I chose for tau down. Okay, so basically I look at the distributions of being, of times residing in the lower state. And what you find is that in the Markovian limit, which for our system means that the memory time is much smaller than gamma minus one, then the distribution is exponential. And that's why you fit this uh, straight line here. This is, a, this is an exponential fit. Uh, remind that this is log 10. Now, um, you can also increase the memory time and um, what you, when the memory time is much greater than uh, the, the inverse dissipation rate, what you find is that the distribution is no longer exponential. Uh, there is this, uh, the distribution actually becomes peak and the short events, which are these ones, become suppressed. And I think the suppression of this one is kind of intuitive to understand based on the fact that you have a slow nonlinearity. It just means that um, 
the system cannot respond, uh, it cannot switch very fast because of this low nonlinearity. And so you, you just don't have fast switching events, right? But then you develop this peak, right? Which are a bit more, less, less intuitive. And then when you look at long times, then you see that it's again exponential. So this deviation from exponential uh, fit is basically the, the delta signature of a non-Markovian dynamics. When you have non-exponential residence time distribution, and that means that the switchings are correlated. That's, that's, that's the, the physical mean. Okay, so let's uh, go to the experiment on a stochastic resonance. I think I built now the, I show you all the ingredients of the system, the nonlinearity and the noise. And now we're gonna show you how, how we do uh, stochastic resonance in the system. So I have again the same kind of cavity. Um, we replace the, one of the DBRs by a metal meter just to lower the quality factor a bit, um, technical uh, reasons, not so critical. Um, and we have this cavity right here. We couple the light in and out through these microscope objectives. And before sending the light to the objective, we have two electro-optic modulators. One of them gives us noise in phase, and the other one gives us noise in amplitude. And these modulators, we feed them a voltage from two different uh, waveform generators. Uh, and so in that way, we get basically uncorrelated noise, yeah? And um, the voltage that we feed them uh, is proportional to the standard deviation of the noise in the equation that I show you, D, yeah? So we're basically just making the, the laser more noisy. But we're keeping the mean of the power constant. And while we are sending this noisy laser, we modulate the cavity length, as shown here, and then we measure the output. And because of the modulation, then you have now a periodic signal, which is what we're going to analyze. Let me first show you uh, the, the transmission of this system when you um, have a high power and you see the instability. This is the curve like I showed you before. Uh, the, the green is coming this way and the black is coming this way. Um, the gray is the steady state solution, which basically doesn't match here and here. And the purple is the dynamic calculation with the memory, okay? And now we're gonna look at two particular detunings. Uh, so basically this one and this one and the fixed laser power. And we're gonna look at the PDFs that I've been talking uh, to you about. But now I'm gonna show you the PDFs of the complex field alpha, right? Because in the previous slide I showed you distributions for residence times. Now I'm gonna show you distributions for the complex field which are related to the amplitude and the phase of the light in the cavity. Um, so this is the, the two axes that you see here. And the vertical axis is the probability in log scale, right? This is basically, we build a kind of histogram. Um, and so panel C corresponds uh, to this detuning. And basically you have these two states in the instability. Where that are related to these two peaks in the distribution. Right? So you see a bimodal distribution, which is the, 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 the signature of bistability. And then there is this bridge, which is the switching events. And basically this peak is bigger than this one. And this C1 is the upper state. And that's because the lower state is very close to being unstable, right? So you're more likely to be found here than here, the system. When you increase the detuning, then you're more likely to be found in the lower state, and that's D2. So basically that's, you know, this is the tilting of the distributions that I was referring to a moment ago, right? So by changing the detuning, which means changing the cavity length, we bias the PDF to pick on the uh, uh, C1, which is basically the high density state, or D2, which is the low density state, right? So we're doing like this. In this case, I just showed you two, two points, right? Like this and like this. All right. So let me show you the measurements now. These are, these are measurements of the transmitted light through our cavity as a function of time for a constant power. And I'm gonna vary the peak to peak voltage that I give to the modulators, which is proportional to the standard deviation of the noise. Um, in this case, I have a, a relatively small voltage. Uh, this is very small, it's close to zero. And you have just the, the transmission of the, of the light, this kind of ramp and this 
triangular ramp is what we do with the, one of the mirrors. We do like this. And so every cycle of displacing the, the mirror is one of these cycles in the uh, transmitted intensity. When I increase the noise by providing a greater peak-to-peak -peak voltage, the signal overall becomes more noisy, but you see sometimes there are these switching events, these rather big ones, and sometimes they're not so big. And here is another big one, here is another big one. But you see there's a kind of stochasticity in when the system jumps and when it doesn't. And so overall, basically I just spoiled the signal. Now, if I increase the noise even further, I go a bit more to 70 volts now. Now you see the system always switches, right? So you recover again this periodicity uh, and the amplitude is greater than it was here, right? So basically I added noise to the system and I increased the amplitude of the, of the signal at the output. Um, if I add even more noise, then the signal just becomes very noisy and not only there is a switch in every ramp, so this is the ramp going up and it switches, and this is the ramp going down and it switches again. So not only there is a switch every ramp, but there are also switches within the ramp. So for example, these events here, and these events here, or these events here, and that just degrades the, the signal to noise ratio. So I'm gonna make uh, this a bit more quantitative now. And I just want to show you two examples of what the, the power spectral density looks. So we want to look that now uh, at these traces in the frequency domain. So these are the same two curves I showed you for a, a medium level of noise and a little bit over higher or medium level of noise. Um, if I take a, we take basically a very long measurement of this time trace and you Fourier transform, you get the, the power spectral density. And that's what's shown here as a function of frequency here. And um, the peak here, the, where the red curve is, is the modulation frequency of the cavity. And you see that there is a peak rising above the noise level. Um, that's basically our signal, and this is our noise. And when I increase the noise, now this peak is much greater than the noise level. And that's basically the essence of stochastic resonance, that when you add noise to the system in a certain regime, then you get more power in the signal relative to the noise uh, at the output. So we, we did this experiment for, for many different uh, levels of noise, which are you know, directly related to this peak-to-peak uh, -peak voltage on the horizontal axis. And I plot here the, the SNR. This is a signal-to-noise ratio um, actually in the first uh, six harmonics. So we not look not only at the fundamental, but at six harmonics. And you find that you know, for in low noise, when you add noise, the signal to noise ratio just decreases. So things get worse. This is the, the expected uh, behavior. But suddenly the, the, the behavior reverses. And then there is this peak. And for large noise, again, it goes down. So this peak is basically what the, the stochastic resonance uh, peak. Now, um, oh, Dr. Rodriguez, do we have yeah? question? Yeah, yeah, please. All right, Go so I'm going to unmute you. Uh, no, Hi. Um, so I have a question about the stochastic resonance. Can you give an intuitive reason for why when you increase noise, suddenly you get better signal to noise ratio? Is there some uh, easy to understand reason? Yes, yes. Great question. Thank you. So um, basically, the, I, I will go back to this analogy with the Kramer's problem, right, of the Brownian particle in a lower well. Imagine that I'm modulating with an amplitude that is um, just below the amplitude necessary to tilt the ball from one well to the other. Yeah? So I don't have a very large amplitude. So deterministically, if there is no noise, the switching never happens. Okay. But when you add noise, basically the noise gives it this final kick. Yeah? And so it's a matter of balancing the amplitude of the modulation as well. Uh, so that every time you make a, a, a cycle, you're close enough to making the switch deterministically, but not quite there. This is what in the stochastic resonance literature is called as sub-threshold modulation. And then the noise gives you the final kick. Yeah? And then because you, know, you cross the barrier and then you just fall to the other well and you give a, get a huge signal. That's oh. basically what happens. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. All right. So 
Um, I show you already stochastic resonance. Now, uh, what I would like to show you is, um, okay, how does the memory time influence the, the behavior of this system, right? What, how is non-Markovian in this type of non-Markovian system? A stochastic resonance different from the Markovian case, right? So we're gonna look, we're gonna look at two different uh, observables. One of them is the signal to noise ratio, which I've shown you before. As a function of noise, um, a standard deviation, D, relative to gamma. And I plotted for three different values of the memory time, which are these three different colors. Um, for all these cases, I fix the period to the memory time to be a constant is a thousand. And I do this because remember in the first part, I showed you that the hysteresis and the visibility basically are completely determined by this ratio. So I want to have a constant visibility and I just want to basically change the memory time. And um, what you see is that as you increase the memory time, this peak grows. Uh, it stays roughly at the same uh, value of D of the noise, but the signal to noise ratio increases for longer memory time. So this effect actually comes from uh, the two, uh, has two contributions. One is because we're making tau longer, but the other is because we're also making T longer, right? And you can also make T longer in a Markovian system. So you may ask, well, um, maybe the, the enhancement in the signal to noise ratio comes from more from the, uh, from the larger period, and that is indeed the case. Um, but the memory time also has another effect, which is to suppress the fast fluctuations. And I want to show you how, um, how that happens now by looking at, um, at another observable that sort of makes the, the role of the uh, memory time more, more, more clear. And we're gonna look at the number of switchings per cycle, which is, I call an average, as a function of the modulation period. I multiply here just by gamma, the total loss rate. So remember I told you in the beginning, stochastic resonance means it's a synchronization effect. The deterministic force synchronizes with the random force. And when that happens, you have two switchings per cycle. Right, so you get one switch in the ramp up and another switch in the ramp down. So here I plot the average number of switches versus the modulation period. And when it equals two, we have a stochastic resonance. Basically, this is when the modulation rate matches the Kramer's rate. Now, what I didn't tell you in the beginning is that this condition only holds in the Markovian uh, limit. So now we're gonna vary the memory time of our system. Uh, and I'm gonna show you calculations for two different values of tau. This is the memory time, which is also experimentally the thermal relaxation time. And you find something quite remarkable, and it is that the number of switches basically goes like this. Um, it increases at a much slower rate, and it develops a kind of plateau. And so um, there is a very large range of uh, modulation periods or modulation frequencies for which you have approximately two switches per cycle. Um, this is in part due to a slow rise of the number of switchings per cycle, which is due to the slow rise of the nonlinearity, because the oil takes time to heat and cool down. And uh, in part because the system becomes more robust to high frequency fluctuations. So uh, basically, um, you know, you add noise and it takes more noise to make him jump. Uh, and so basically this is what's uh, happening uh, also for longer periods. Um, now, I, we can look at what is the average number of switchings, the range, excuse me, in which the average number of switches is two plus minus some quantity, right? Uh, which I show here 0.1, right? Arbitrary, but just to give you an idea of, um, you know, anyways, a stochastic resonance is this condition approximately doesn't have to be very rigorously too. Um, and then we look at the, uh, the bandwidth for stochastic resonance, which is this delta tau mod as a function of memory time. And you find that it grows linearly. So this green curve is this data point, the purple curve is all the way down here, and the instantaneous is all the way down here. If I extrapolate this curve, to the tau of our experiment, which is about 10 microseconds, you find 
that the bandwidth for stochastic resonance in our normal coherent system is eight orders of magnitude greater than for a kernel linearity. So this means that our system can harvest fluctuations across a very, very large frequency range, right? So basically, you know, uh, regardless of the signal that you put, noise within an, uh, this huge bandwidth, noise will play a constructive role. Um, and I think this is, a, this is a very interesting result because one of the que big open questions that at least I had um, in the context of stochastic resonance uh, is how is it that an effect that is so fragile because it requires matching the noise to exactly the, 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 the Kramer's rate, how is it that an effect that is so fragile is so prevalent in nature, right? I mean, you have so many noisy environments with so many different uh, noise levels. And how can you have so many different stochastic resonance with so many, many different noise levels? Um, so this is one plausible explanation. I'm not saying this explains all of things or all, even two or three. I'm just saying one plausible explanation. Um, I think, uh, so I'm almost done. I have just, uh, you know, basically one or two minutes only. Uh, so I want to give you a perspective. Uh, so where, um, so we started thinking, okay, this is interesting physics, but okay, we have a, a drop of uh, oil in the, in the cavity. Okay. You know, if we think a little bit broader, where one could use this, right? Um, and, you know, there is this, uh, I started my talk with telling you how nature systems or cases where nature turns fluctuations into an advantage, right? And we saw the, the paddle fish and we saw the, the light harvesting complexes, but we humans also do that, right? There is this whole class of devices called, um, that do energy harvesting, which is basically some kind of, you know, cantilever that has a piezoelectric material that um, transduces the mechanical motion into an electrical signal. And basically this is a way to harvest energy from fluctuations, which are widespread in, uh, around us. You can think of a car vibrating, right? And so basically you could put this thing there and you will get electricity out of this. Um, you could think of having you know, one in you, or you could think of putting them in bridge or in buildings. Um, they are very interesting alternatives to batteries uh, in places where you don't want to be changing the battery uh, regularly. And so, but the bottleneck uh, of these systems is that they only harvest fluctuations near the resonance frequency of this guy, and that's very limited. But the spectrum of fluctuations is very broad. Right? So, um, we think that, um, so there was this paper that showed that in a nonlinear system, you can have a fluctuation from a larger frequency range and with greater efficiency, but still not so large. And so we think that if you were able to put a kind of slow nonlinearity on the system somehow, uh, and if anyone has ideas or, you know, is thinking of something like this, this could be a very interesting uh, concept for uh, enhancing uh, energy. Um, energy har harvesting from, uh, you know, very, you know, sort of broadband reservoir. Um, this is actually where we are going, is my final slide. Uh, so everything I showed you today was for one cavity. We had one of these concave mirrors uh, with a drop of oil when we look at non markoian dynamics there. What we would like to do in the future uh, is, um, so basically make a lattice of these cavities and look at uh, collective effects things like noise assisted transport, you know, simulate this kind of light harvesting complexes, for example. Um, this is an image I got a courtesy from uh, Aurelien Trichet and Jason Smith at the University of Oxford. Uh, so they make this kind of lattices. Um, so this would be one way to, to realize this. Um, and then you could measure the, the output in the different uh, states. I will leave it like that. If there are questions I can uh, address in the end. And before ending, I would like to, to thank my, my group uh, that did uh, all the, the hard work uh, of what I presented. So mostly, uh, most of the work that I did, uh, that I presented today was done by Kevin Peters on the stochastic resonance and Joe Gang on the dynamic hysteresis. This is a picture of the group uh, before uh, COVID times. Uh, and uh, I also like to take, uh, thank Jason Smith and Aurelian Trichet and Ken Almin from uh, Oxford. They provided uh, the concave mirror with which we did the, the experiment and also the, the funding agencies. And um, with that, I would like to thank you and I'll be happy to take your questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez for the very nice talk. So we have some questions. 
All right, so first, uh, uh, wait, wait. go ahead. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, this was a very nice talk, uh, and I would like to understand better the role of the of the drop of oil. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, well, you you said in in a previous answer that uh, the origin of the non Markovianity was uh, not exactly the same one as you would have in in the analogy with a Brownian motion. Uh, so I. I I would like to understand, like, why then you, uh, how could that relate to to the viscosity of the of the material of the substance that you're using inside the cavity? Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay, there's two two parts. One is the the relation of the uh, nonlinearity in the Brownian particle. So, um, okay, I think uh, first I have to clarify that um, in the optical system. What the nonlinearity gives you is the effective double well potential, right? So it's not the same as, uh, just to be clear, it's not the same as the, the Brownian particle motion being nonlinear, right? Uh, with some other force, whether it be random or deterministic. So um, now, in the, in the context of generalized Langevin equations or these Mori type equations where uh, you have non Markovian dynamics, um, in those cases, the the non-Markovian dynamics come because the interaction between the Brownian particle and, and, and the bath is not instantaneous, right? And so basically there is a, a finite time in which the, the, the particle you can think interacts with the air molecules around or sort of just lo loses heat or, or gains, right? Um, and this time is the memory time. Yeah? And this time is also related to the correlation time of the noise. Now, in our system, I have assumed this to not be relevant. It most likely is relevant, right? The interaction of the light field in our cavity to the, to the, to the bath, which is basically you know, outside, um, is also not instantaneous, but is probably fast enough to be neglected, surely, actually, in our system. So I have assumed that uh, the dissipation is instantaneous, and so, you know, in, for an equilibrium system, it would give you white noise. Now, in our system, what happens instead is that the oil, when it absorbs a little bit of the laser light, it heats up. And this heating up is what, you know, basically changes the effective potential from parabolic to double well. But the time scale on which this potential changes from parabolic to double well uh, is finite. So it's about 10 microseconds. And it's the time that the oil takes to heat up, right? And so during this time, the response basically, you know, depends on the, on the past, you know, because it, it has a certain kind of inertia, right? It's kind of, you know, moving. There is a memory time. And that's, that's basically uh, the origin of the, of the memory in our uh, oil. So the oil just serves to, to absorb a little bit, but not too much because we still want the light to go through, right? Um, and then the, the nice thing of the oil is that the temperature change given a, 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 an, an, in, an input intensity is large enough to, to see this uh, by stability. Oh, I, I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so we have another question from Well. Um, sorry, Said. So uh, let, let me ask you a naive question. Uh, may, may, maybe I'm wrong with this, but. So, okay, so suppose instead of, I assume you use these quantum wells to do all these experiments, but suppose you wanted to use quantum emitters to do the same. So would it be accurate to say that I could mimic a very slow change of nonlinearity by say with, a, with some flow of emitters into the cavity? So, I mean, uh, if I say change the concentration of emitters as a function of time, but very slowly, uh, by injection of these emitters into the cavity, wouldn't I get a very similar effect to the things that you are talking about? Because uh, like it, it would basically mimic some sort of opposite effect of saturation, mm -hmm. but then so in a very slow in the time example, scale. In the example you are giving, well, where, where does the nonlinearity come from? 
Okay, so I mean, the way I think about it is, so if you pump, say, emitters, then uh, the Rabi splitting, say, reduces, right? But then okay. that's the yeah. same effect. Uh, the, this is what you guys call face -space, absorption. face space feeling, right? Saturation. Okay. okay. But then okay. if I yeah. do the if I do the opposite, where um, now I inject uh, particles into my cavity, such that the number of emitters increases as a function of time, but in a in some uh, slow time scale, like in your say in how your temperature effects are modulating the the nonlinearity wouldn't I get very similar effects than what you are doing? I think in principle yes. I I, I have yeah. I mean you can also get by stability from saturable absorption, right? Sure. Um, and so yeah, um, I have not thought about you know changing the number of emitters per se, but I think it's not so different then, because it's yeah, collected. In, the, in that yeah. in that in that case, as, as you are saying, it's kind of a gimmick, right? Like you, it's yeah. not really nonlinear, although in principle you're attaining the same effect. I think you will get something similar. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I need to think. All right. So if we don't have any more questions, um, let's thank Dr. Rodriguez one more time for the nice talk. And, yeah, thank you before, much. and before we end, I'd like to make uh, one quick announcement. So I'm going to share my screen now. OK, so I'd like to announce next week's talk. Remember, it's the same time, 9 AM Pacific time. Um, it's Wednesday, August 12th, and we're going to have Professor Randall Goldsmith from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he'll be presenting photonic plasmonic hybridization explored via single particle microresonator spectroscopy. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending, and have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Okay. Nos vemos al rato. Bye.